here and here, and we know the distance from there to there, uh, and we can measure these angles, then we can calculate the entire size of that triangle, and if we do it very well, we'll get it right. And so the uh, ancient Greeks were actually able to measure the size of the Earth by this method, and even approximately the distance to the moon. Some of them knew this answer. Uh, now the distance to the sun was too hard for them, it's too far away for them to me measure that angle. But astronomers, nowadays we've been able to do this for billions of stars, and, um, and so we know pretty precisely, but it still only works out to relatively short distances. As af after a little while the angles are too, too small and you can't measure them. So <coughs> what do we do next? Uh, the next story is uh, things that are faint are farther away than things that are close. And we have what astronomers call the inverse square law, that uh, the brightness diminishes as the inverse square of the distance away. So um, if we, now if we have uh, two candles and we think that they're the same, we can calculate the ratio of distances. So this is simple, except it's not. Uh, the hard part is to see if those two candles that look similar are really the same. And so astronomers have spent or wasted or whatever many, many decades trying to figure out whether things that look the same really are. But if we can get it right, then we can make very precise calculations. So uh, the next thing we want to know is, well, how fast is stuff moving? <coughs> and so uh, some things move across the sky very quickly. Planets do. A uh, planet uh, or may orbit the sun uh, every few years, or even uh, in the case of Mercury, every three months. <coughs> the uh, moon goes around us every month. Uh, the sun looks like it goes around us every year. Um, but there's only a handful of things that do it fast enough for us to see. So uh, for more distant things, we have the capability of measuring one additional factor, which is, is the thing coming towards us or going away? And if it's coming towards us, then the light that we receive it from it will be a little bluer, shorter wavelengths. And if it's going away from us, it'll be a little redder, longer wavelengths. So we do this by spreading out the light from a star with a prism or a grating. And so we see these little characteristic bars across the spectrum, and each one comes from the um, effects of a particular atom or molecule or ion in the atmosphere of the star. <clears throat> so what we've seen is that uh, almost everything's going away from us. And so uh, we can we measure the distances uh, by the triangle method or the, sur or the standard candle method, and we can gather, also get the speeds um, th this way with what's called the Doppler shift. <clears throat> So in 1929, Edwin Hubble did this, and he got the first few points on this chart, uh, and he plotted the distance of distances of uh, faraway galaxies in uh, millions of light years in one direction, and uh, the speed that they're going in the other, and they're almost all going away from us except one. <coughs> and so uh, he got the beginning of this, and, it, and right away it was recognized that this meant the whole universe seems to be expanding. So in 1929, uh, he discovered the universe is expanding and uh, the worldwide economy collapsed. So which was the better news? Uh, anyway, he got a tremendous amount of uh, public uh, recognition for this. Uh, it was front page news around the world uh, before sound bites, so people actually read and appreciated these things. Uh, and he was a tremendous hero. <clears throat> now, um, now I want to tell you uh, some more stories about this. Um, it wasn't exactly quite right at the time, he had the distances incorrect. The, uh, the candles that he thought were the same were not the same. So he thought the distances were smaller than they really are, but nevertheless he said the universe is several billion years old <coughs> and uh, everybody was paying attention. So all you do is you divide the distance by the speed, you get a constant number, which is the age of the universe. That's how long it took for that pattern to emerge. So uh, people, some people are pretty skeptical, but nevertheless front page news. I want to show you the people who thought about it before it was discovered. <coughs> so let me start with Einstein over here. Everybody knows who he is. He gave us relativity theory, <coughs> among other things. He said uh, space and time are not what you think. They are actually mixed together according to how you're moving relative to somebody else. <coughs> that was in 1905. In 1916, he gave us the additional complication that space and time are curved by gravitation. So this was the first time we had a law of gravity that should apply to the whole universe, even if it's infinitely large. Because <coughs> we had Isaac Newton's theory, but it, we knew it didn't work right for a very, very large universe. 
So Einstein uh, had his equations in 1916 and pretty quickly figured out that he needed to add this particular number, which we call the lambda constant, to his equations to make sure the universe would not be expanding or contracting because all his friends said, well, everybody can see that the universe isn't changing, so it's got to be steady. <coughs> so we added this little number to the equations. Um, a few years later in 1922, this young fellow, a Russian, uh, wrote to him and said, well, I've worked with your equations and you know what they say, the universe might have been pretty different a long time ago. It maybe it was expanding and um, I don't see why you had to put in that constant in your equations. <coughs> so Einstein basically didn't pay much attention. <coughs> As I think he wrote back and said, you're, you're wrong, basically. Uh, in 1927, this young fellow over here, Georges Lemaitre, who was a, a Jesuit scholar and priest in Belgium, was also working on these equations. And he came to the same conclusion that he had, and he had enough nerve to keep after Einstein and, and kept, kept insisting. He said, I think there was a great primeval explosion. He called it the primeval atom. Um, <coughs> Einstein again wrote and said, uh, that's foolish, you're a bad scientist. Um, but uh, it was only two years after that that uh, Hubble made his discovery that I just showed you. And of course, Einstein had to ap apologize, and he said that was his greatest uh, blunder. Uh, so <coughs> a lot of history went into that, and very forceful personalities. Um, so this was in the time uh, when a scientist, uh, Einstein, getting off the boat from Europe, could be greeted by 10,000 people in New York. So there was a time when we were even greater heroes than now. So now I want to show you uh, three scientists who were working on this same subject after World War II. George Gamow came to George Washington University from Kiev in Ukraine, uh, and in 1948 he was thinking about the Big Bang. He's an amazingly creative fellow, and he said, well, let's think about what happened to that explosive material. Uh, it should have been hot. Where did the heat radiation go? Uh, and what about all those chemical elements? What if the Big Bang actually made the carbon and the oxygen and the nitrogen? And I told you earlier that it didn't, but he thought, well, maybe it did. And so uh, he got this young fellow who was a postdoctoral fellow and uh, a graduate student, and they calculated and thought, and they knew now something about nuclear reactions because he had to think about that a lot for uh, nuclear weapons. <clears throat> so now we had a lot of progress, and they made their calculations. So uh, they still thought, at least at first, that the chemical elements could have been made in the Big Bang, but they also said the heat radiation should still be here, and it should have a temperature of about five degrees above absolute zero, five Kelvin. So they were right about that part. <clears throat> now in 1948, this would have been a very th difficult measurement to make, and uh, nobody actually tried at the time. Now, later on in 1965, this radiation from the Big Bang was discovered, and a Nobel Prize was given for it in 1978 to Penzias and Wilson, who found it. Uh, they weren't even looking for it. Uh, but <clears throat> I think in 1948 it might have been possible, uh, the, with the clarity of hindsight, we know what we would have done. It might, uh, you could imagine that people could have tried and succeeded, but they didn't. So it was a wonderful surprise in 1965. <clears throat> now I want to explain something terrible to you. Uh, there is not necessarily a center or an edge of this universe. Uh, <clears throat> almost everyone that comes to my talk says, well, where was the middle? And what does it look like? And the answer is that there wasn't a middle that we know of. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why. <clears throat> I've got three astronomers here. Uh, each one can do his or her Hubble calculation and say, uh, I find the uh, universe is expanding. Uh, they're all going away from me. This one says, uh, divide the distance by the speed. It was an hour ago that we were all together. <clears throat> this astronomer here can make the same calculation and say, well, we were all together an hour ago. I agree with you. Uh, but I think I'm in the middle. So, you know, there's no grass in space. They can't tell who's moving. So um, <coughs> the conclusion from this is there is not necessarily any center. So, of course, astronomers have been looking to see if there's a center, and we never found one. As far as we can tell, every direction in the sky is pretty near the same as every other direction if you look far away. So uh, pretty random pepper out there, uh, very very random pattern and no sign that there's a center or an edge, uh, no sign that the universe is spinning, no sign that there's an equator, um, and no sign even that there's a, that, that if you could look farther you would see past all the stuff. So um, maybe there is, but we can't see it. So this is a terrible disappointment for people. 
we cannot draw you a picture of what it looked like. <coughs> All we can say is there was a big bang. And if I had proper sound effects, it would be very loud.